An unfortunate trend in the world of video games began in the 1990s with the advent of FMV games, full motion video. These were games which made themselves out to be playable movies. No more pixelated sprites and generic platforming, instead you'd be controlling real life people and experiencing true photorealism because it was live action footage. At least that was the intention. In reality, CD-ROM technology at the time didn't have the capacity to support proper video, and so the live-action footage was severely compressed, and the resulting cutscenes often had low resolution, weird visual artifacts, and just didn't live up to the hype of the idea. It also didn't help that most of these titles made for poor movies, and even worse video games as well. There were exceptions here and there, but most FMV games featured poorly written stories with obnoxious characters and bad actors. On top of that, the actual the actual gameplay was either extremely basic, poorly designed, or was simply broken. However, a celebrated gem within this trend were Wing Commanders 3 and 4, developed by Origin Systems. The first two Wing Commander games were successful space combat sims with some RPG elements. Players controlled a hotshot fighter pilot during an interstellar war between the Terran Confederation and the Kilrathi Empire. The game's creator, Chris Roberts, now known today as the Star Citizen guy, saw the potential in FMV technology and sought to deliver on the promise so many other titles failed to do so. Wing Commander 3 not only used FMV cutscenes, but also made the switch to 3D polygon graphics. But much of the $4 million price tag, a hefty sum at the time, was used to give the game some real star power. Mark Hamill, John Rhys Davis, Malcolm McDowell, and Biff from Back to the Future, among others. The game was released in 1994 and became a major hit, earning strong sales, critical success, and a dedicated fanbase whose nostalgia I am currently preying on for this video. After almost 27 years, how does Wing Commander 3 Heart of the Tiger hold up today? So, a couple of caveats before tackling this game's presentation. Obviously, this is an older game, copies of which are hard to find outside of some second-hand shops or eBay and so on, so the version most readily available to play today is an online digital download. The task of updating and optimizing the game for modern machines is an ever-ongoing task, and so getting it all to run smoothly may require some work. I say this because I know some veteran Wing Commander fans may be watching this video who have had this game for quite some time, and I I'd ask these people to take what I have to say about the game presentation-wise with a few grains of salt. This game came out a year before I was born, after all, and the machines it was designed to play on stopped being manufactured before I was in high school. I'm also not the most tech-savvy person in the world, but I tried my best to look up tweak guides and ensure I was playing the best possible version of the game I could get my hands on. However, I am aware there may be some technical solutions to some of the game's problems I simply don't know about. With every review I'll be making on this channel, this is only my experience, of course. If I've missed a trick or two and you think I'm being unfair, feel free to comment why. This may be a game I replay at some point, so if you know of any extra technical tricks which could make the replays better, please let me know. With all that out the way, this game is janky as fuck. While it is true the FMV cutscenes are of a much higher caliber production-wise, the audio-visual compression is severe and is difficult to overcome. If there is a fix for the audio of this game, please tell me all about it. There's a lot of popping, stuttering, and intermittent dropouts. During dialogue, it's not as bad, but it's always noticeable. <laughs> The resolution of the image is also really low, it's so low in fact that the live action footage inadvertently ends up blending in better with the virtual surroundings. That's not to say there isn't good work going into these elements, however. It's just that this work is being let down by the technology of the time. Over the years, there have been various remasterings of the footage, and it looks and sounds terrific, as if you're watching an actual sci-fi TV show from the 90s. And looking at the game through that lens, it's easy to see why this game and its sequel were so well-liked. It tells a simple, almost traditional war story, but it's told well. Mark Hamill is awesome as the player character Colonel Blair, a war hero and player character from the previous two games assigned to the TCS Victory, an old outdated rust bucket carrier which Blair thinks of as a backwater posting at first. Naturally, the crew of the Victory don't take kindly to being looked down upon either, but as they fly missions together and continue to fight the Kilrathi, they all grow closer and become a real team. 
As I said, it's simple but well executed for the most part. Almost all of the cast are strong and the ensemble of characters are really memorable, charming, intriguing and or badass. The only one I didn't like was Rollins, I just found him very irritating. He's supposed to be this quirky oddball with a dash of conspiracy theory obsession but I never found him very funny and took every opportunity to give him a verbal smack in the face. As a sci-fi nerd, I enjoyed a lot of the production design and the setting in general. Primitive early polygons force the artists into designing very blocky looking ships but that doesn't stop them from looking pretty cool. The Hellcat especially feels like one of those iconic designs to go right alongside the X-Wing or Star Fury. The practical effects for the Kilrathi were a lot of fun and in general I really enjoyed them as a faction. I am a cat man after all, so even though they're supposed to be humanity's mortal enemy, I also want to give most of them a big cuddle. The sound design and music for the game is also strong. The weapon sounds for various fighters, Terran and Kilrathi are distinct and pack a lot of punch. Everything in general feels grounded and industrial. This isn't the gleaming future of Star Trek. I wouldn't even compare it to Battlestar Galactica. In fact, the universe it reminded me of most was actually Red Dwarf, and I mean that as a compliment. It just has that feeling of everything being made in a model shop out of spare parts, an effect which I find quite charming. George Olze's music is something which suffers from the data compression, but if you can find isolated tracks, it's a good score for the game. It's clearly made with synthesized instruments, but there are a lot of memorable themes which are enjoyable to listen to on their own. Gameplay-wise, the game is split into two sections, exploring the victory and talking with the crew in FMV cutscenes, navigated using a kind of point-and-click interface, and then there are the missions where you fly a fighter of your choice into combat. As I said, despite the quality compression, there's a lot to enjoy from the ship-based side of things. To make a modern comparison, there's a Mass Effect routine of sorts which you can settle into. Fly a mission and then go talk to the crew. What hampers these segments though is the dialogue system. This is something modern AAA RPGs also struggle with, so I'm not going to be too hard on Wing Commander 3 with this, but it does have that problem where the abbreviated options sometimes make it unclear as to what Blair will actually say if you select it. Sometimes you can get on somebody's bad side by accident. Other than that, this side of gameplay is solid. The mission side of things are a little tricky. There are no tutorials for any of the mechanics in this game, and I mean none. I have to admit, as someone who is raised on the convenience of console gaming, I found the game pretty frustrating at times. Obviously when the game came out, the developers included a game guide with all the controls and mechanics explained, and this is thankfully included in the GOG version of the game. That being said, over the years the game has been modified for different control setups. Originally the developers intended for a keyboard and joystick, but I've heard an earlier GOG version only used the keyboard, until mouse and joystick support was added back in. As a result, depending on which version of the game you get to work on your machine, your controls may be different. I found myself having to dive into forums occasionally occasionally because the control for a certain action listed in the guide wasn't working. Some may say it's a good thing the game doesn't hold your hand, and I understand the expectations of its release, but it would have been nice to not have to consult so much outside material to learn how to do these missions. For example, when I started my first mission, this happened. If you didn't catch that, my fighter just slammed into my wingman and destroyed his craft in about one second. This was because my mouse was idle and because the direction of your mouse controls your trajectory, the nose of my Hellcat just slammed full force into the engines of my wingman. Honestly, this happened to me several times. You have no frame of reference for where your fighter is going to be pointing until you start the mission. Therefore, I just decided to hit the autopilot key as soon as the mission started so I could get my ship out into space as soon as possible and avoid these kinds of accidents. The actual dogfighting and flight mechanics though, once you get into the swing of things, are awesome. There are alternate camera modes, but I always stuck with a cockpit view. The controls feel intuitive, the gameplay is fast paced and exciting. These aren't Newtonian physics though, it's airplane rules. Pursue an enemy craft, shove laser beams, plasma bolts and missiles up their ass, and take evasive manoeuvres when you're getting shot at. At its core, the loop is very simple, but it works. Different fighters have different strengths and weaknesses. The Thunderbolt is the heavier of the starting fighters. It packs a bigger punch and has stronger armour, but it's not as fast or manoeuvrable. The Arrow was the one I used the most. The main weapon isn't as strong, but it carries a lot of missiles and is extremely fast and agile. The Hellcat is the happy medium. 
Later in the game, you also unlock the Longbow. This was personally one of my least favourite fighters. It's basically a space tank. It has the most firepower, the biggest armament, but it's about as agile as a dead manatee. And when you're dealing with the Straka stealth fighters, or as I like to call them, fucking invisible cunts, which cloak and then reappear when attacking, being unable to quickly reacquire your target can be enraging. Easily the best fighter of the game is the Excalibur. In the story, it's a prototype ship, with only one of them on the victory for most of the game. It has the most powerful weapons, an armament as big as the longbow, and is as fast and agile as the arrow. Naturally, of course, you only get to use this fighter in a handful of missions. My biggest gripe with the gameplay, though, is it gets quite repetitive. Either you're shooting down enemy ships to clear the path for your battle group, or you're shooting down enemy ships while escorting some transports. Once all enemies are destroyed, you autopilot to the next nav point and do it all again until you've finished your objectives and can return to the victory. There are some more specialised missions, but that's the general gist. The second last mission is almost identical to a dozen you've already flown. As I said, the combat itself is really fun, but it would be nice to have a bit more variety. Story-wise, I'm going to be spoiling everything, so if you haven't played the game, skip to this timestamp for my conclusion. As I said before, the story is generally strong, the characters and cast are great, and I like the setting a lot. However, the weakness is in the plotting. It feels like a bunch of episodes strung together. I can certainly understand if that was the intention, but it can make the campaign feel a bit aimless at times. For most of the early campaign, the battle group jumps from system to system, sweeping away defences while Blair gets to know the crew. It's time which is used well in establishing who everyone is and setting up potential arcs for everyone. I was especially fond of Vaquero. The dude was just so friendly and I admire anyone with any kind of musical ability because I have hands like Shrek. Captain Eisen was that perfect Picard-esque balance of authority and empathetic. Maniac was great and Tom Wilson was an absolute riot. Everybody knows about the Maniac. Everybody. How many people here know about the Maniac? Oh what, nobody? But I immediately made Hobbs my best friend. As someone who hadn't played the previous two games, I was super interested in a Kilrathi who was fighting for the Terrans. Things get interesting when Blair challenges way too cocky test pilot Flash to a simulator battle. And yeah, kicking this guy's ass is immensely satisfying. But afterwards the character manages to come across as quite likeable after admitting how arrogant he was. The first half of the campaign effectively ends during a mission to stop the Kilrathi deploying bioweapons against a confed world. I will say, by this point in my first playthrough, I didn't know all the controls and so couldn't engage my afterburners to catch up with the missiles, so I failed this one. And I gotta commend the commitment of the writers because there's almost an entire alternate mission set where you just straight up lose. No restart mission option, just keep playing more missions where how much of an utter failure you are can truly sink in. After discovering how afterburners worked, I loaded a previous save and went from there. I know. I'm an idiot. The second half of the game is where things kick off, however, when Malcolm McDowell's Admiral Tolwyn reappears with a superweapon capable of destroying an entire planet. I know the Confed aren't totally squeaky clean as good guys, but I feel like the moral implications of building a planet killer could have been explored in a bit more depth. And yeah, I know the irony of Luke Skywalker protecting a planet-killing superweapon, but frankly the joke was too obvious for me to make. Shockingly though, a traitor aboard the Victory tips off the Kilrathi, who quickly swoop in and destroy the superweapon. During the chaos of the operation, Blair's nemesis, Thrakath, reveals Blair's lover Angel was killed in action and challenges Blair to a one-on-one. -on -one. From here, there are two options, retreat with the victory or try and kill Thrakath before your mothership jumps away. Back on the victory, the traitor is revealed to be... Hobbs! I was genuinely shocked by this. Hobbs was basically my Garrus for this game. After he kills a fellow pilot, Cobra, you have the option of going after him and shooting him down, but this would inadvertently kill Vaquero as well. Luckily, John Rhys Davis, doing a pretty decent Scottish accent, jumps in to inform the victory of another backup superweapon, the T-Bomb. And this is what I mean about the weaknesses of the episodic style plotting within a single campaign. It kind of feels like they've pulled this whole T-Bomb thing right out of their ass. While gearing up to attack the Kilrathi homeworld, we get some romance. Blair can get with either fellow fighter pilot Flint or engineer Chief Rachel. From what I understand, most people prefer Rachel for that Kaylee-type energy, but personally I liked both of them as characters, so I literally flipped a coin in my playthrough and landed on Flint. 
What's really weird about this though is the reaction from the other love interest. If you choose Flint, Rachel from then on refuses to help you with loading out your fighter and if you choose Rachel, Flint from then on refuses to fly as your wingman in later missions. In either scenario, both characters come across as very petty and it makes the whole romance feel a bit shallow unfortunately. The final mission of the game has you using the Excalibur for some aerial combat. While I appreciate the variety, these missions felt super clunky gameplay wise. The lack of detail tail in the ground sometimes makes it very difficult to judge exactly how close you are without a landmark. Also, I don't know if this is just me being stupid again, but for some reason I always ended up either upside down or perpendicular to the ground and I couldn't right myself despite using the correct controls. It made the whole thing very disorienting. Now, I know I said it earlier I was avoiding Star Wars jokes, but the final mission of this game is literally a trench run to fire a torpedo into a small hole and blow up the enemy base, this time the base being their entire planet. After this successful mission, Blair is found by some Kilrathi who surrender themselves to him and sign a peace treaty with the Confederation. It makes sense in terms of Kilrathi culture, but it does come across as very abrupt. With the war over, Blair and the love interest of his choice fly away peacefully to a new planet, looking forward to a brighter future. Or in my case, he goes alone because Flint got killed during the final mission with literally no acknowledgement from anyone. <laughs> Mark Hamill's just like, oh well. <laughs> In conclusion, while Wing Commander 3 is undoubtedly a game which shows its age, I totally understand why it was such a hit when it came out and why it has such a dedicated fanbase today. Despite a lot of jankiness and frustration, the story and characters are really strong and the gameplay is loads of fun for the most part. Me being an insufferable millennial, I've been spoiled by the likes of Mass Effect to really love this one, but I enjoyed my time with it overall. I liked it enough to want to play Wing Commander 4 as well, which I'll be covering in a later review. While I don't see myself going back to this one anytime soon, I give Wing Commander 3, Heart of the Tiger, a big thumbs up. Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, be sure to like, subscribe, and share to stay up to date on all of my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, jump over to my Patreon where you can see videos early, uncut, and ad-free. Speaking of which, I'd like to say thank you to all of my patrons and members now appearing on screen, with an ultra thanks to Stacked, Tom, Dusk, Colin Camille, Patrick Fleming, Will Martin, Matthew Camille, Ed Mark Starr, Dylan Thomas, Lilac Yane, Howard Craig Akervik, and Kajing G. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.